You have already completed your statement, so the chair will uh, ask you a series of questions. Prior to July 17, 1989, were you aware of the unapproved deviations from ANDAs in manufacturing equipment and procedures? No, sir, I was not. Can you tell us what you know about those matters? The only issues I understand today are those raised from the investigation. It's important to note that the investigation is being directed by the outside directors and the outside consultants hired for that purpose. Certain people like myself are not included in that loop at this time. So you, you, you are telling us that because these inquiries by your outside directors. We wanted a completely independent review of the total operation of ANDA's manufacturing practices at all of our facilities. We felt the best way to do that was for the board to direct the outside directors as independent outside directors to retain their own consultants at their request at company expense and report with counsel. Well, what was it that triggered this inquiry by the outside directors? Was it any knowledge that you or any other officer or employee of the firm had independent of the inquiries that were made or were made or are being made by this subcommittee? I believe the incident was around the triumphant switch. I'm sorry? I believe the, the, the incident that created the investigation was the triumphant switch, triumphant hydrochlorothiazide product. Was there anything else? So you know about that. Do you know about any other events that have occurred at either Quad or Par? No, sir. None? No, sir. Okay. Now, Mr. Levine, prior to July 6 of this year, 1989, were you aware of destruction or suppression of any evidence or records requested by FDA investigators? No, sir. Not at all. Do you have any knowledge of it at this time? Just from the investigation that the company, company outside directors have instigated. What is that knowledge, please? Revolving around the, the, the um, switch of the triumphant hydrochlorothiazide sample, uh, discrepancies in paperwork of uh, orphangesic and orphangesic forte that were mentioned earlier, um, and discrepancies in the paperwork of the underlying R&D of leucovorin calcium, which was also mentioned before. You said destruction of paperwork associated with what? I don't believe I said dis destruction of paperwork. Right. What did you say? Discrepancies in, paper in the underlying R&D. Discrepancies in yes. paperwork. What were those discrepancies? In which product are we referring to now, sir? Well, in any product. Let, let's go through them. In, in what, in what products did have discrepancies in the, in the paperwork for FDA and record keeping on, on tests and, and procedures required by F, FDA occurred? All right, let me go through those, those few products then. On the leucovorin calcium, as was mentioned earlier by the FDA inspectors, what they found during a, an inspection was that the R&D support showed a batch of, I think it was 50,000 tablets when the, the fact was that the amount of material available to make that could have only made 25,000 tablets. Um, on orphangesic forte, when the inspectors looked for a specific batch number, I believe in the file in R&D was two, batch, two batches with the same number. Uh, one batch was a 50,000 batch used for bio study, and one batch was a 25,000 batch size that was not used for bio study. Now, how and can you explain that? I don't explain it. I have no. I have no explanation for you whatsoever. Was this a regular practice in the company? I don't believe so. But what we're doing now is to find out the extent of these type of deviations and these deficiencies. Well, in the case of, here, we have a case, in a case of one drug, we have a batch listed as being of a certain size when raw materials necessary to make that batch 
would produce approximately half that, num half that number of tablets, or half that amount. Why did that occur? I'm sorry? Why, why did that occur? I don't have an answer. The only one that can answer that is probably Mr. R.K. Patel. As I said in my opening statement, R.K. handled R&D and production. Ashok handled regulatory affairs and the lab. I might not have mentioned those names when I, when I said that in my statement. Uh, the R&D is a separate facility off of our, our block area. Um, I have no answer as to why he would do that. Well, why, not that he would do it, but why it happened. Did you talk to uh, Mr. R.K. Patel about this matter? I only discovered this from the investigation over the last few weeks. Did you ever talk to him about how he conducted his manufacturer batches and, and his record keeping? I mean, I'm curious. You're, 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 you, have the, you have the responsibility for dealing with regulatory affairs. No, 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 sir. You don't? Mr. Geller has. I'm um, sales and marketing and some, some business administration. You dealt with sales and marketing? And you, some business administration. You didn't administration. deal with regulatory affairs at all? Not at all, sir. Well, now, were there any reports filed by the R&D people or by the manufacturing people? They had R&D meetings that regulatory affairs and the R&D people would meet on um, to determine it's a weekly status meetings. They had weekly status meetings. Did you attend them? No. Who did attend them? I believe uh, Mr. R.K. Patel, um, his, uh, some of his production people, um, Mr. Geller on some occasions, or one of his associates perhaps. Now your, your title in the company again is what? Executive Vice President. Your Executive Vice President. Does the Executive Vice President get the minutes or the reports of uh, the R&D people or the regulatory affairs people or their meetings? As I, I unfortunately know, as I said in my opening statement, sales and marketing was autonomous, regulatory affairs and the lab was autonomous, production and R&D was autonomous. I'm curious, that we feel was an important cause as to the breakdown in this, this communication. Doesn't regulatory affairs, or rather doesn't uh, the executive vice president deal with matters like R&D and regulatory affairs? Doesn't Not he no. deal with manufacturing? No, no you sir. Were, just ex were you executive vice president for just sales and marketing or were you executive vice president for other things too? Executive Vice President for Sales and Marketing and some general business considerations. My father, as you know, is in poor health, uh, especially recently because of these events. Uh, the actions of his partners trouble him greatly, and he's profoundly disturbed by it. I, I, so I've been I, trying to help my father over the last period of time to relieve him of some of his uh, burdens, because he's been wanting to retire for quite some time. That I, I, I'm, I find that interesting, but I, but I remind you that my question is, didn't you receive minutes and reports and information with regard to the conduct of the business that was going on involving regulatory affairs and, regard, and, and involving R&D? No, sir. You did not. Ashok Patel was senior vice president to me. He was a founder. He handled all regulatory affairs and all the laboratory. The reports went to him. He was a senior official to me. The same thing so he handled those matters. And Mr. R.K. Patel in production and R&D was senior to me in charge of those two areas and, and all the reports went to him. Now you indicated that your father, Mr. Levine, was the head of the company, is that right? Chief His title is president. Did he get copies of these? I don't know, sir. Well, were you aware of the switch of retained samples undergoing stability tests prior to July 6, 1989? No, sir, I was not. What do you know about that? To this day, very little. Who would know about that? I guess would Mr. R.K. Patel. Would, would the president of the company know about this? No, sir. 
He would not? No, sir. What does the president of the company do? Mr. R.K. Patel handled his functions. No, no, no. What does your father, Mr. Levine, the president of the company, do? Does he do anything? Does he know what's going on in the company? Or does he, what does he do? He's been pulling himself away from the company over a period of time. How long? He originally wanted to retire two years ago, and his partners would not let him. And there was a lot of internal strife over that. Um, his health has been deteriorating. And they asked him to stay on, and he spent less and less time in the office. Did you authorize the counsel to the company to inform this committee that you had run the, run the company for the past two years? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Did you authorize the counsel to the company to inform the staff of this subcommittee that you had run the company for the past two years? No, sir. You did not. Who did run the company for the past two years? I guess you could say there was about three or four people that each had expertise in certain areas that contributed. Who, did, who, who were these people? Mr. Rashik Patel, Mr. R.K. Patel, Mr. Perry Levine, myself, who? Perry Levine, myself. Uh, we had input from um, accounting, sales, marketing. Okay, so you have two Messrs. Patel and two Messrs. Levine, you tell us, who are running this company. Did the Messrs. Patel and the Messrs. Levine meet to discuss questions relative to the operating of the company? The formal operation of the company was very loose. We would have meetings over lunch, there would be discussions, um, we did not have formal uh, meeting times or agendas. Uh, the par pharmaceutical side of the, of the corporation um, is about $50 million in sales. Uh, the total picture of par consolidated is $100 million. Half of that obviously comes out from Quad from Indianapolis. Uh, each of the individuals at par brought a specific expertise to the table. I could not do regulatory affairs, Perry could not do production, Ashok and RK could not do sales and, uh, and marketing. And that's why I was saying before that we feel that some of the problems that we did have would have been alleviated if in fact we did not have such an autonomous separate operation for each of those functions. Well, there were problems with Quad and there were problems with Par, both. I understand. Now, did you, ha did you have a meeting amongst the two Messrs. Patel and the two Messrs. Levine when this problem came to be, or, or were, were there no discussions amongst them at that time? I don't believe there were any discussions amongst them. So you never had any discussions? None of the Levines had any discussions with none of the Patels? I, that's and correct. When, 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 when the committee started its inquiries into these matters? Well, there was only one Patel left. Well, well, I'm not sure of the timing did, when you're... Did you have any discussions with the one Patel that left? And did you have any discussions with the one Patel that remained? I'm not sure if I'm following discussions as to what, sir. Beg pardon? I'm not following your line of question. Discussions I'm trying to... to understand. One Patel is fired because of the situation that we are inquiring into. One Patel remained. Did you have any discussions, either, either you or your father, with either of the Patels in the course of the process? over the matters into which the committee is inquiring. Can you, I'm not sure which matters you're inquiring about. Well, substitution, <coughs> record keeping, <coughs> bank when, sizing. Okay, okay I'll, I understand. These, these, these are, are matters, I gather, of modest importance. A number Sir, of items, I was a getting number Patel. of pharmaceuticals have been recalled. A fair number of them are no longer marketed. Uh, did, did, didn't, didn't you folks talk about these matters? When the switch became known on the, I'm not sure the date, the 19th, when, when it was reported to council, within a day, two days, Mr. Patel was asked to take a leave of absence from the company. He was asked to take a leave. And he resigned, as I find out, this past Friday. 
Were there any discussions correct. with him that were held prior to the time that he was asked to take a leave? Not that I believe, no. No, so he just was asked to take a leave? Was, was there any reason given him why he was asked to take the leave? The board of directors of the company asked him to take a leave pending investigation because of the seriousness of, of what happened. I wanted to correct you before when you said Ashok Patel was fired. He had, he had resigned. Did the board of directors call you in to discuss these matters? Not as to uh, Mr. R.K. Patel. They did not. Did they call you in to discuss any part of the matters, substitution, record keeping, batch sizes, things of that sort, into which the committee is now inquiring? They made inquiries of me, yes. Did they call you in? The into, board. into the board room? Yes. Yes. They did? Yes. Did they call either of the Patels? Uh, there was only one Patel there now. It's there was only one Patel, but there were two there before. Did they call either of, either of the men before they fired the one? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't mean to, to interrupt, but I think there's a confusion on the timing here in, in your question. And, and, uh, well, I'm just trying to find out whether the board talked to anybody. You fired one, the board fired one Patel. If the board didn't fire one Patel. No, Mr. Did they talk to either me, of the Patels me, in connection with these matters before they fired the one Patel? <laughs> no, well, that was the right Patel. Um, Ashok Patel resigned, I believe, back in April when he pled guilty, agreed to plea to the illegal gratuities. So R.K. Patel resigned this past Friday. I, so I want to make sure that the timing of the Patels is under, that we understand the, the timing. I'm trying to figure out where either of the Patels called in to discuss this after the first Patel pleaded guilty. Mr. Asha Patel handed in handed his, his resignation, as did Mr. R.K. Patel. They were not fired. Okay, so they weren't fired. They, they handed in their resignation. Were they called in? before they handed their resignations in? Um, Mr. Ashok Patel did his on this at the same timetable when he agreed to plead to a illegal... Uh, no, his, his question is, were either of them interviewed by the police? Is that right? That's a fair question. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Rackman. Were either of the Patels interviewed by the board? Yeah. Prior to their handing the resignation? Yes. I don't recall that. Now you're 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 the executive vice president in charge of marketing, sales and marketing. And, okay. The marketing was affected by these events, was it not? Yes, sir. Did you ever inquire of either of the Patels in connection with with why marketing was being affected by these events and what was going on? I'm sure there were discussions as to with Ashik Patel. Well, are you sure, or, or were there discussions? I'm sure that there were discussions. I mean, if I were, if I were in charge of marketing and, and, and all of a sudden I couldn't market something, I, it, because there had, been, there had been some kind of behavioral failure in the organization that had caused a recall of, of the commodity or the pharmaceutical, I think I'd ask him, what's going on? Now, no. did you do that or did you not? Mr. R.K. Patel was interviewed by the board. All right, but what did you do? As, as to what? Well, as to any of the matters that caused Mr. R.K. Patel to be, reviewed, uh, to be interviewed by the board. Once the, inter once the incident became um, uh, known to the board, which was on that uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, Mr. Patel was not allowed in the office. There was no opportunity for, for R.K. Patel. There was no opportunity for discussions, period. You talked to the other Patel? He was gone for six months, sir. He was what? He resigned five months prior to the incident as to the switch. Did, had you ever talked to any of them about what had been going on? It's definitely affecting marketing, is it not? Yes, sir, it is. What, did, what was the impact on the, on the revenues of the company? Well, the illegal gratuity issue had some effect. The incident with Mr. R.K. Patel has been devastating. And I have not spoken to Mr. Patel since, the, <laughs> since he left the building Month well, didn't so. this pique your curiosity enough that you felt compelled to call these good gentlemen, these two good gentlemen by the name of Patel in to have them tell you what they were doing and, and, Sir, and we, what was going on? We've been led by counsel through this whole, all these episodes. 
We have no discussions with these individuals. We do not talk to the individuals. This is under advice of counsel, and that's what we've been following. When were you instructed by counsel that you were not to talk to the Patel? On the day Mr. Ashik Patel resigned, I believe it was in April, we were told by counsel at that point. That you should not, was that should, done in writing or was that done orally? I believe it was done orally. So you, so you didn't talk to them at all about any matter? They had no dealing with the operation upon their resignation. When Ashik Patel left in April, he has not had any action whatsoever. He has no involvement. He's an employee. Well, did you, ever, did you ever talk to their successor? His successor? We yeah. have not retained a successor yet. Mr. Geller has been filling that position. Well, somebody's got to be running that part of the company, don't they? Well, I think... Is we, there anybody running that part of the company? The regulatory affairs and the laboratory is being run by Mr. Barry Geller. By, run by who? Barry Geller has been Oshik's assistant for six and years. By Mr. Geller? Yes, sir. Did you ever talk to Mr. Geller? Yes, we've had conversations. You've, you've been introduced, so you do know each other and you do talk. We've had many conversations. Did you ever talk about these matters? As to these, these incidences? Yes. Not prior to our learning of these when they became known. Now, Mr. Levine, prior to July 17, 1989, were you aware of other unapproved alterations in the chemical formulation of drugs? No, sir. No? No, sir. Were you aware of unapproved changes in manufacturing sites prior to July 17, 1989? No, sir, I was not. Are you aware of that now? Just from the discussion this morning, that's the first time that I had heard that. Do you know where, where the pharmaceuticals that are manufactured by Par and Quad are in fact manufactured? Yes, sir. I want to stress again, I want, I want to make sure you understand that the investigation that's been taking place during this episode has been conducted by the outside directors, of which I am not one. They retain independent outside consultants. They communicate to each other, and they have not been communicating to management. I, am I given the impression that here, or would I be correct in having the impression that you don't know what goes on in manufacturing ever? You'd probably be close to saying that. Would that be proper? I have no scientific background, no chemistry background. I'm sales and marketing. That's my responsibility. Well, I once knew a fellow who said that you didn't need to be a chicken thief to know how to get a hen off the roost. I'm curious, how much knowledge does one need to know uh, when to, to understand where the pharmaceuticals are manufactured? I know where the pharmaceuticals are manufactured. I don't have the knowledge. Well, you, but you, did you know? Did you know that the site for manufacturing of some of the prescription pharmaceuticals we're discussing here was different than that which was reported to food and drugs? No, sir. Didn't. Um, were you aware prior to July 17 of the reworking of <coughs> batches without approvals? No, sir. Were you aware of the failure to investigate cases of out-of-specification production runs? I'm sorry, I, I can't hear you, sir. I'm sorry. We're, we're, sorry. Were you aware of the failure to investigate cases for out-of-specification production runs? No, sir. Now, Mr. Levine, prior to July 17, 1989, were you aware of lost inventory cards for raw material usage? No, sir. Um, prior to July 17, 1989, were you aware of color discrepancies between any bio batch and the production batch? No, sir. Mr. Levine, were you aware of production usage inventory withdrawal charge to R&D accounts to cover up unapproved changes in formulation? No, sir. Um, prior to July 17, 1989, were you aware of alteration of raw material inventory cards? No, sir. When did you become aware of these events? Pretty recently from the, from the results of some investigations. And that's the first you knew of it? I swear. 
How much time did you spend in the offices of either PAR or QUAD? QUAD, once every six months. Once every six months you went well, to QUAD. How often, how often did you go to uh, PAR? Well, you know, PAR, I was there. I was in and out. I mean, that's, my, out. that's the home base, yeah. How much in and how much out? Maybe uh, 75 in and 25 out. Did you, did you ever talk to the Patels? Sure. Yes. Do you ever talk to them about about their about the pendency of applications or any matters relative to the business of PAR in in connection with its applications for ANDAs of food and drug? Sure, there were discussions regarding that. What they tell you in connection with that? Well, we we had reliance upon their ability and their knowledge. If they said to us that uh, an approval was just received, I would go out and I would sell and market the product. <laughs> Or if they sent an application to Washington, they would tell me the product so I can prepare for market introduction. Now, were you aware of falsification of batch size records on batches used in bio studies prior to July 17, 1989? No, sir. Were you aware of R&D lab results recorded on scrap paper prior to July 17, 1989? No, sir. Do you know why that would have been done? No, sir. Would that have, would, would one of the purposes of that have been to permit unlawful discretionary transcription uh, in official records? I would not know, sir. You couldn't deny that it could have been one of the purposes, though, could you? It could have been just to rewrite them neatly also. I don't know. Is that, is that proper under the regulations of the Food and Drug Administration? I don't know if there is a regulation regarding that. Mr. Levine, were you in any way aware prior to July 17, 1989 of illegal gratuities to FDA chemists and to a supervisory chemist at FDA? Prior to July 17, yes. 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 You were aware of it prior to July 17? Yes. When did you become aware of it? The first instant was when PAR and QUAD received subpoenas by the um, uh, U.S. Attorney in Baltimore, which was last summer. So it was in 88 that you became yes. aware of this. Did anybody else in the company become aware of it at, at that time? I think everybody in the company became aware of it at that time. What internal inquiries were made at the company at that time? We retained the firm of Williams and Connolly, and they went out and did an investigation. And what did they, what did they conclude from that investigation? They, well, what they investigated many individuals once they learned as to who the individuals were, which happened in the fall, I believe, but didn't happen in the summertime. Um, and they, uh, the individuals at that time retained their own counsel, and I'm not sure what conversations took place. We had our own corporate counsel. Did they submit to you, submit to the company a report on that investigation? I don't recall that they did, sir, no. You don't know? I don't recall if they did. Do you know now whether they did? No, I do not. Would it be unusual if they performed an investigation and didn't submit a report to the company? Well, they could have submitted a report to our internal, our inside counsel. Was this matter ever discussed at the meetings of the board? I, yes, sir. Well what, well, what was the discussion which took place on, on this particular report at the meetings of the board? Well, the, the, the first board Understanding was when the subpoenas came in in the summer. We complied with the request and supplied all the documentation to the U.S. Attorney of Baltimore. We became aware as to the individuals who were selected as or, or being considered targets in the investigation, uh, which I believe happened in November. Um, and individuals had counsel for themselves at that time. So I don't know what interviews our attorneys had with those individual. Well, apparently the discussion was not very, very thorough at the board. You don't remember it. Do you, do you sit in the board meeting? I only became a board member in December of 88. So you became a board member in December 88. Did, did you, were there any other changes in, your, in the status of your association with PAR uh, either in December 88 or at any other time? Since July of, uh, since last summer when the subpoenas were served? No, just the... Just that, you became a board member. Well, did the board ever discuss this since you became a board member? Yes. 
Well, what were the discussions? The discussions evolved around uh, legal counsel's advice to us on how to deal with the individuals that were selected as targets. Were considered Did the board ever make any inquiry? Uh, the board got reports from attorneys who were making the inquiries. Did the board get a report from Williams and Connolly? The only, the only conversations we had were oral uh, conversations that I can recall. I'm sorry? The only conversations that I can recall, or the only documentation, if you will, were oral conversations. Oral conversations? Presentations made to the board. How much, how much did the board pay Williams and Connolly to perform this inquiry? <laughs> I'm sure it was a lot. <laughs> well, I am too. And, we, and, and since it was a lot, would I be incorrect in inferring that it probably entailed some kind of written report? Some what report? Some kind of a written report from Williams and Connolly. I don't recall seeing, ever seeing a written report. The we, board never saw it? Not that I can recall, and sir. The board never discussed it? I'm, I'm sure the board had conversations, like I said, from the attorneys, but as to a written report, I don't recall seeing one. Does the board see written reports of this kind, or does it not? If they were presented, I'm sure they'd see them. Beg your pardon? If they were presented, I'm sure they'd see them. So you're telling me that the board pays a lot of money, gets a, gets, gets a report somewhere or other, but doesn't see it? Well, the company pays a lot of money. And if a report is issued, they will, be, they will receive it. I just don't recall, sir, if a report was issued. Would you supply any written reports that you have received from any of the attorneys that have investigated these matters for the company so we can have a look at it? Maybe, maybe if you can't help yourself with them, we can. I don't believe I have custody of those reports, but I can make a request for you to the board of directors. Very well. You would, if you would, please. The, uh, can I turn it over? Yeah. Chair, chair announces that I have uh, other matters that I have to attend to. The chair is going to request a gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Wyden, to preside. The chair is going to excuse himself. Gentlemen, thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Levine, some questions uh, for you, particularly with respect to some of the questions that I asked uh, Mr. Geller uh, earlier. Mr. Geller's testimony referenced several discussions involving you. Do you deny the substance of any of those discussions about which Mr. Geller testified? Yes, I do. Could you uh, be specific in which areas uh, you would deny uh, the assertions made by Mr. Geller? I would, I would like to, sir. The first I became aware of the incident was when Mr. R.K. Patel spoke to me in a, in a rush and in broken English uh, and was interrupted by somebody else coming to my office. And what he said was that uh, he and Barry had switched a triamterine sample for the FDA. We were interrupted. He turned and left. I was obviously surprised and didn't understand half of what he said. I went down to Mr. Geller's office and I said, R.K. told me what he did. What the heck is going on? And Barry said, you know, like, you know, I don't know. We had a brief discussion. I said, all right, let's check the batch record and let's check the ANDA. I said, is Barbara, uh, Barbara Manners was in-house counsel. I said, is Barbara aware of this yet? He says, I don't know. All right, let's talk with R.K., then we'll have to talk with Barbara. RK, and then, and then I, I left looking for R.K., who, and he had left already. And that's when I found out he didn't come back for the week. I have no recollection at all that Mr. R.K. was in my office prior to the switch. And I know for a fact that the first time I found out about it was when he told me after the occurrence of the switch. Mr. Geller also gave the insinuation that I run the company. Obviously, after hearing what you're hearing, I don't run the company. Wednesday morning, we did have a meeting 
uh, in my office uh, with Mr. Geller and Mr. Uh, Patel. Um, and at that meeting, um, Perry came in to the meeting and heard for the first time what had happened. Perry, who you don't know, does not use a profanity. What was coming out of his mouth at that time was incredible. He was furious. He was going to rip R.K.'s heart out. At that point, R.K. became very, very shaken, visibly shaken. It was at that point that R.K. said, well, you were there, Jeff. And I said, R.K., I wasn't there. And thank God Barry was there, because Barry said, R.K., it was just me and you. He wasn't there. And from that moment on, I had no conversations with Mr. R.K. Patel. The last item I would dispute was Mr. Geller saying that there was a discrepancy between the words investigate, and I remember specifically saying that we had a talk with Mr. R.K. Patel. I don't re ever recall saying the word we had to investigate Mr. R.K. Patel. That doesn't recall at all. Well, Mr. Levine, uh, Mr. Geller has, has told us that he got a call from you saying that the conversation of that morning never took place. No, sir. You're, you're denying the validity, the truth of what uh, Mr. Geller I'm, said. I am, challenged, I am questioning his recollection. That's what I'm doing, sir. All right. We decided that if we would not forward the information to counsel, but if we were asked, we would not, not deny it. Did you uh, call Mr. Geller from the airport? Yes, I did. I called him twice, as a matter of fact. And what did you discuss with Mr. Geller on those occasions? At the first phone call, I called from LaGuardia to the office to ask Mr. Geller's impression as to what did he want to do. Did we forward our conversation to counsel or not? We couldn't make up our mind. I called him again when I landed at, uh, in Washington, and we decided at that point to not forward the information, but if asked, we would not deny it. When you met with uh, the subcommittee staff, uh, Mr. Levine, did you say that Parr and Quad were being, quote, stuck by the, uh, the two bad people? I don't recall if I used those words, or no. Is that the substance of what you uh, told the subcommittee staff when you met with them? The flavor of the meeting was to go over the events and discuss the two individuals involved with the gratuities. When the incident occurred to the time of that meeting, I had real no, no knowledge whatsoever as to the incident that occurred with the triumphant hydrochlorothiazide. At the time that we met, I should have forwarded information to you regarding that, and I didn't. And I re regret that I didn't. But the whole flavor of that conversation was focused around the two individuals, the gratuity issue, and the relationship with the company. The meeting was held at your request, was it not? Company request, yes. Did you also disclose to the staff that Mr. R.K. Patel had informed you of a switch of samples provided to an FDA inspector? I'm sorry, say the question again, sir? Did you also disclose to the staff that Mr. R.K. Patel and inform you of this switch of samples provided to an FDA inspector? At that meeting? Yeah. No, sir. Did you also disclose to the staff that the fact that this switch had been corroborated by Mr. Geller? No, sir. What more did you need to know in order to conclude that wrongdoing had occurred? I felt, and I still feel, that the, the proper thing to do was to talk with Mr. R.K. Patel to find out the factual basis. He is a senior official to me in an area that I have no responsibility in. I have no, I can think of nothing to justify my failure in acting more swiftly. After speaking with Mr. Geller and asking him to investigate and talk or look into the, the batch records and the, uh, that I would talk with Mr. R.K. Patel, once it was disclosed to counsel within a day or two days of that meeting, the attorneys that we used actually did the same thing. They wanted to speak with Mr. R.K. Patel to find out the factual basis. And also, as, as I had alluded to, was to determine the best program for procedure for making disclosure. Mr. Levine, before July 17th of this year, had you discussed Mr. Patel's action with counsel for the company? No, sir. Why not? 
I wanted to speak with Mr. R.K. Patel personally to bring the full facts basis to light and then sit down with counsel to determine the proper procedure for disclosure. Is it your sworn testimony that all times subsequent to July 6th, it was your intention to conduct a significant internal investigation of this matter and to make disclosure? It has always been my intention to make full disclosure of that incident. One last uh, question, Mr. Levine. In light of the problems that have been uncovered by the FDA and this uh, subcommittee, and in light of some of your inactions as well, why should uh, the public have confidence that present management is really up to the task of cleaning up this mess? As I said in my opening statement, we've taken some severe actions, voluntarily ceasing distribution of all our pharmaceuticals, even when there's no evidence of any problem with the product itself. We are looking now for a new CEO, which has been announced publicly of, of weeks ago. We're in the process today of re-reviewing every piece of paper created within R&D, every piece of paper of any batch made under our control today. Every product that is, be, that is being shipped from our facilities has been reviewed by 10, 15 different people with sign-offs and checks and counter-checks. Mr. Geller can fully explain the protocol review, which is quite detailed. Let me recognize my colleague from, uh, from Texas if he chooses to ask any uh, questions. Uh, Minority Council have any questions? Unless our witnesses have anything uh, further, we want to thank you again for your cooperation. We'll excuse you at this time. Thank you very much. While uh, the names uh, for place, uh, placements are being altered, let's just go through uh, the formalities. The chair at this time calls Mr. Roger Jordan and Dr. Seymour Hyden, who are appearing voluntarily. The chair also calls Dr. Steve Colton at this time to respond to the subpoena issued by this subcommittee. Without objection, a copy of that subpoena will be inserted into the record at the appropriate point. Gentlemen, would you please come uh, forward? Let us uh, proceed, and uh, I would like to ask, uh, please, please be seated, Mr. Fox. We, we, Mr. Fox, at the appropriate time, you will be recognized. We have, as you, uh, I believe, have seen earlier, have uh, gone through this before. 
The client has been directed to appear by subpoena. At appropriate time, you will be uh, recognized. Please be seated. Please, Mr. Fox, Mr. Mr. Fox, please, Mr. Fox, please be seated. We will recognize you at the appropriate time. Your, your client has been directed to appear by subpoena. You will be re recognized at the appropriate time, Mr. Fox. Please be seated. M Mr. Fox, due process, something that Chairman Dingell and this subcommittee feel very strongly about. We, we, we will recognize you at the appropriate time. Let me ask uh, each of uh, the witnesses to uh, identify themselves. Let us begin with you, uh, Mr. Jordan. The Vice President. Mr. Hyden, again, the, the microphone is not the best. I'm Seymour Hyden. I'm the Executive Vice President for Technical Affairs of Vitarine Pharmaceuticals, Inc. Dr. Colton, could we get a microphone and have you identify yourself? Dr. Stephen Colton, former Vice President of Research and Development. Thank, thank you very much. Gentlemen, it is the practice of this uh, subcommittee that all witnesses appearing before the committee are required to appear under oath. Do you object to appearing under oath? No, sir. Yes, I object. I object to taking the oath because I believe the committee has not complied with my rights under the rules of the House. I believe I have the absolute right not to be photographed even preliminarily. My attorney evoked this right on my behalf in a letter written to the committee on 8-28-89. My attorney also has asked that this hearing be held in executive session because information elicited may tend to be defaming, degrading, or incriminating. I believe such testimony may be received in open session only if a majority of the subcommittee is present and votes to have this hearing in open session. That request for executive session pertains not only to my testimony, but to any testimony given at this hearing pertaining to me. Dr. Colton, your request for an executive session is not appropriate and is uh, denied. Mr. Minor, a majority your, of the committee your, must your, vote. Your, your request with respect to uh, the testimony not being filmed will be taken at the uh, appropriate time. Mr. Wyden, a majority of the committee must vote before this committee subcommittee can have an, an open session but, after we have made invoked our rights under the House rules. Mr. Fox, the chair makes the determination in this matter. Would you look at the House rules, sir? Because we do not intend to participate if you are not going to comply with the rules of the House of Representatives. The, uh, I'm referring to uh, the assertion of the Fifth Amendment is not testimony, nor does it tend to defame, degrade, or incriminate any person. Yes, but we suggest that other testimony, some that has already been elicited despite our request, and testimony that will be elicited, may tend to defame and degrade and incriminate. And once we make that request, under rule, I believe it is 112K5A, a majority of the subcommittee must vote before this session can be held in executive session. I'm, I'm advised by counsel that the assertion has to be made by a member, and it has not been made by uh, a member. 
So would, you, request, would the council refer me to where in the rule it says that? The request is denied. Because there's nothing in the rule that says that, sir. <clears throat> I, I will repeat again to council and uh, have already read the rule that the assertion of the Fifth Amendment is not testimony and the request is denied. We are not relying on the Fifth Amendment. We are relying on the fact that other testimony from other witnesses may tend to degrade, defame, and incriminate. And the rule says whenever it is asserted, it does not say it has to be asserted by a member. We have asserted that right and we have the right under the House rules to go into executive session unless a majority of the subcommittee votes to the contrary. A majority, not of those present, but a majority of the entire subcommittee. Seven votes. Well, again, Mr. Fox, I've repeated myself several times on, on this point. Uh, the request is denied. If if uh, your client uh, refuses to testify, testify, the committee will take it under consideration with respect to, to the consideration of, uh, of contempt. And uh, let me now proceed uh, Mr. with Mr. Uh, if you could explain to me why my reading of the rule isn't correct, then I could advise my client correctly as to whether or not he should testify. He has, those, he has a right to be advised. I hear nothing from you but a ruling. I hear no reasoning. There's no parsoning of the rule. And I think we're entitled to that. He's entitled to be advised by counsel. Mr. Fox, again, this has been the traditional ruling of the House and the traditional ruling uh, of the chair. I've uh, cited the specific uh, uh, assertion uh, that we uh, base this ruling on, and uh, I would again like to proceed, uh, proceed with this, and uh, uh, your uh, request is denied. But you have not given me a reason. You've told me it's tradition. Tradition does not comply with subset capital B. The committee shall proceed to receive such testimony in open session only if a majority of the members of the committee, a majority being present, determine that such evidence or testimony will not tend to defame, degrade, or incriminate any person. There is no majority present. Mr. Fox, uh, submit for the record any additional views uh, that you wish to make. You are here solely for the purpose of advising uh, your, your client. I'm, your, I'm also here to protect his constitutional we're, rights. We're going, we're going to have to proceed and now. And the constitutional rights include his right to due process, which includes his right to have this subcommittee comply with the rules of the House. We, we are going to have to uh, proceed uh, you know, with, uh, with our, our hearing. Let me ask uh, uh, you first, uh, Mr. Jordan, do uh, you desire to be represented by uh, counsel today? Uh, that that is satisfactory. Dr. Colton, who will be your attorney today? Excuse me, we're still conferring, sir, as to whether to respond to the committee's questions. I'm sorry, your question was? I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Yeah, you asked me who my counsel was? Yes. No, Hamilton Fox. Okay. Uh, skip over. 
Gentlemen, the chair notes that copies of the rules of the committee, the rules of the subcommittee, and the rules of the House in the green and red books before you at the table are there for your information to advise you of your rights and the limitations on the powers of the committee. Do any of the witnesses object to appearing uh, under oath? Uh, Mr. Jordan? No, sir. No, uh, sir. Doctor? Dr. Colton? Yes. Mr. Jordan and Dr. Hyden, if you would, please rise and raise your right hand. You saw me swear a testimony about to give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but truth about the guy. I do. Uh, then begin with you, uh, Mr. Jordan. Uh, Mr. Jordan, the, the subcommittee will recognize you for any statements you may have and for any requests you may have. We've Do objected have to the photographs, sir. The, uh, the witness may state uh, an objection. He already has. At, at this point, counsel has stated. I have an objection to photography. The witness will point. state the objection. The witness will state the objection. You stated it twice already, Mr. Wadden. Mr. Wadden, I have an objection to photography taking place in this session. That is a uh, absolute right afforded uh, under the committee. The chair directs the cameras to be tapped, to be pointed at the ground. That applies to all recording devices other than the public uh, recording uh, device and that uh, must be done at this time and includes C-SPAN and all uh, recording devices. Mr. Wyden, may I be heard for a moment? Mr. Kemp. Mr. Jordan and Dr. Hyden, in order to are appearing here voluntarily. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear. Uh, Mr. Jordan and Dr. Hyden are appearing here voluntarily. They have come prepared to be on film in a public session and would feel that there might be some negative connotations were their testimony to receive uh, we, 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 we appreciate that. As with the previous panel, we will have to deal with that here in just, uh, just one moment. <laughs> Dr. Colton, then let us uh, begin, with, uh, begin with you. And let me instruct again that the cameras must be turned uh, off as the witness has uh, requested uh, that it be done pursuant to the rule. At this point, cameras were turned off. As we resume, Roger Jordan, president of Viterec Pharmaceuticals, and Mr. Hyden begin their testimony. Mr. Chairman and members of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, my name is Roger W. Jordan. Since March of 1985, I've been the president and chief executive officer of Viterine Pharmaceuticals, Inc. With me today is my friend and business associate, Dr. Seymour Hyden, who is executive vice president of Technical Affairs at Vitarine. Early in 1985, Dr. Hyden and I joined Vitarine Pharmaceuticals at the behest of new owners. I was brought in to reorganize the company and improve its performance. Our prime priorities were to rehabilitate the plant and to establish a strong research and development department, and we were assured by our owners that adequate funding would be provided to satisfy these needs. In late 1985, Dr. Hyden and I were able to convince a, a man whom we felt was one of the best young research and development men in the industry to join the firm. We had known this individual, Dr. Steve Colton, for six years at Cord Laboratories where he had completed his pharmacy internship and risen to a senior position as a research and development scientist. He joined our firm in late 1985 as director for research and development and was later promoted to vice president of research and development. Our strategy in late 1985, knowing that the FDA redu review times for ANDAs generally ran from 12 to 24 months, was to ignore products irrespective of market size coming off patent before 1987. We selected a grouping of low sales volume branded products and only a few higher sales volume products with an emphasis on sustained release. This strategy worked well initially and in the period between mid-1987 and mid-1988, we were able to obtain approvals for 17 products six of which were first approvals. Our progress continued until the shocking discovery this past April of possible irregularities in one of our ANDA filings, 
which would have allowed for a product to be made in our facilities in St. Croix rather than only in Springfield Gardens. During the course of an FDA inspection at our St. Croix facility, questions were raised which led to the discovery of an apparent discrepancy between the number of capsules actually filled in the batch used to support that ANDA and the number of capsules reported in the ANDA as having been filled. Our confirmation of this discrepancy led, to led us to voluntarily undertake an examination of all of our product development work in our Springfield Gardens plant. To our total surprise and dismay, this examination revealed that there were apparently similar misstatements or deficiencies regarding batch sizes and a significant number of our ANDA filings. A reoccurring inaccuracy was an apparent overstatement of the number of tablets or capsules produced in the batches used in support of ANDA filings. Sufficient product had been produced to do the necessary stability and bioequivalence testing, but there were statements in the ANDA filings that had more tablets or capsules were produced than had actually been produced. When the earliest of these findings was confirmed, Dr. Colton and his associate, Dr. Nowako, who had <coughs> conducted all of the development work on these drugs, were suspended and excluded from company premises. When we found these apparent misrepresentations, Vitarine promptly called the FDA, and on April 24th, even before we were able to meet with the FDA, voluntarily stopped distribution of all products that Dr. Colton had been involved in. It took nearly two weeks to obtain a meeting with the FDA, but one was held on May 3rd, 1989. We told the FDA everything we knew at that time. We told the FDA that all distribution of products in which Dr. Colton or his associate, Dr. No Dr. Nowako, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> had worked on from the time Dr. Colton started at Vitarine had been voluntarily discontinued, and we requested that all pending ANDA applications on file with the agency be suspended from consideration until our investigation was complete. On May 26, 1989, the FDA asked us to recall two products, generic diazide and decepramine, because FDA felt that new bioequivalent studies should be required to confirm the results previously submitted for these products. We elected to recall not only those two, in addition, 10 other products where we had not had sufficient time to investigate fully the history of the biostudy batches. We had no reason to believe that any products we had produced posed any questions of safety or efficacy, and that is still true today. It should be emphasized that all products recalled or discontinued met finished product release specifications in all aspects as established in the, in the approved ANDAs. Nevertheless, we issued a voluntary recall on every product where we could not fully document at that time that the batch size of the lot used in the bioequivalent study was of sufficient size. Where indicated, we initiated new bioequivalent studies from large-scale production batches for products which had been approved during the tenure of Dr. Colton. In addition, we began reconfirmation through comparative in vitro testing and accelerated stability testing of the integrity of all products with respect to which there could possibly be a question. In mid-June 1989, Dr. Colton and I jointly discovered... I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Hyden. <laughs> in mid-June 1989, Dr. Hyden and I jointly discovered that a return sample of a drug labeled as a Vitarine product, which had been used in a bioequivalent study, was in fact a disguised sample of the brand name product against which it had been tested. Dr. Hyden spoke by phone with Dr. Colton and his attorney to determine if there were any other products which might have been tested in this manner. Dr. Colton suggested that two other cases in which this may have happened we later discovered a third during the course of our investigation. Fortunately, none of these four products had been approved for marketing, and we had previously, on May 3rd, asked the FDA to discontinue any evaluation of these applications. Nevertheless, we immediately reported these findings to the FDA and expanded our in-house investigation to determine whether there were any other products, marketed or, un or unmarketed, where similar misrepresentations might have occurred. Our investigation resulted in the dismaying discovery that in the case of one marketed product, triamtrain 50 milligrams and hydrochlorothiazide 25 milligram capsules, samples of the brand name product, diazide, appear to have been submitted to the BioStudy Laboratory identified as a Vitarine product. We immediately reported this discovery to the FDA. I would like to emphasize that our initial discovery of a disguised product involved in a non-marketed, non-approved product this situation became known to the FDA only because we voluntarily reported to them. Had we not done so, we believe that none of these events would yet be known to the agency. Based on the new information, we extended our recall of the triamtrine hydrochlorothiazide capsules to the retail level of distribution. It is important to note that the results of a recent bioequivalent study on a production lot of our triamtrine hydrochlorothiazide capsules 
confirms that there are no safety or effectiveness concerns relative to this product. Mr. Chairman, it was our investigation, ordered in the strongest terms by our Board of Directors and myself, that brought the extent of these tragic events to light. We have promptly reported to the FDA every instance of possible concern as we discovered it without even considering whether we were legally obligated to do so. We voluntarily recalled and suspended distribution of all products possibly affected. At a cost of over $2 million, we have initiated reconfirming bioequivalent studies on production lots and in vitro studies on other products to confirm safety and efficacy and to cure any possible deficiency that might have existed in our ANDAs. We have reduced our workforce from 267 employees to 139 employees, and we have reduced our product shipments approximately 30, to approximately 30 percent of what they were. Over the course of the past two months, we have submitted to the Food and FDA documentation reconfirming the in integrity of many of our products. These are totally free of problems, but were voluntarily withdrawn as a precautionary measure. The response of the FDA has been either silence or to announce, as it did three weeks ago, the intended withdrawal of 25 of our ANDAs for products which they knew we had voluntarily taken off the market four months before the letter was written. The message being sent by FDA's response to Vitarine's voluntary corrective action is that they intend to inflict the maximum damage on us. That message can do nothing but discourage other firms from coming forward in the future upon the discovery of wrongdoing. Mr. Chairman, I spent four years in the military, and I understand the military adage, it happened on my watch. I acknowledge that it happened while I was in charge. I have absolutely no explanation for the tragic, foolish, inexplicable, and possibly criminal, criminal conduct of one or two of our most highly trusted employees. I cannot see, even by hindsight, anything that would have shaken our trust at the time. They cleverly slipped their misconduct by us, and we're paying an enormous price. We have voluntarily taken every possible action to be certain that no product was on the market which was subject to any question. We, re we removed not only the products with respect to which we had questions, but also those where we had not yet eliminated all possibilities of questions. This has, been a co this has been costly and will be more costly if we remain unable to market those products with respect to which there are no problems. I sincerely hope for the sake of our loyal, competent, and innocent employees, our stockholders, and our customers, and all who are innocent victims of the misconduct of one or two men, that we will find it possible to survive. This is not easy when the misconduct of one or two men is being treated by the media and the FDA as though it were company policy, and when we are continually being lumped together in the media with those who have engaged in gratuities and bribery. Commissioner Young has reported as saying in testimony before your committee that he would like to shoot Vitarine. If Vitarine is to be shot for what is essentially the misconduct of one or two men, and I fear for most human institutions, including the one over which Dr. Young presides. We should be very concerned to protect the public and punish those who are to blame, but not try to punish further those who are innocent victims. We at Vitarine are in many ways ourselves victims of this tragedy. We will either survive or go down with our honor, integrity, and conscience intact. All we can ask or hope for is the fairness from, is fairness from this point forward. Mr. Chairman, my colleague, Dr. Dr. Hyden and I will be happy to answer any questions that we could. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Jordan. Dr. Hyden, do you care to make any uh, opening statement or have any uh, requests that you would like to make at this time? I have no additional remarks. All right. Mr. Jordan, we hear a great deal about the substitution fraud. Could you describe for us what happened at Vitarine that led to your initial discovery of this particular problem? Uh, well, Uh, what is it? It was on June. I'm June. June. June I'm 7th. Probably, you find I'm probably. Let, yeah. let us let us have one person testify. Right, at a I'm time. probably the better one to answer the the question. That that will be fine, Dr. Height. <clears throat> on um, late Wednesday afternoon, June seventh, <clears throat> I opened a bottle of uh, that contained the return sample from a bioequivalent study performed on verapamil SR tablets. There were two bottles, one which contained the Innovator product and the other bottle which was supposed to contain the Vitarine product. I was surprised to find that the sample that I looked at that was purported to be the Vitarine product was green in color when I knew our ANDA had indicated the product was to be white in color. I uh, contacted do uh, Dr. Colton and his, through his attorney that afternoon to try to obtain an explanation 
and Dr. Colton was unable or unwilling to afford an explanation to me. As I continued to examine the situation and, and not being able to come up with a conclusion, I walked into Mr. Jordan's office with the tablets, and upon examination, he and, and then I subsequently realized that on appearance, it appeared as though these might well be the brand name product, which had been overcolored. Uh, we broke open several of the tablets, obtained a sample of our own tablets from our own ANDA submitted batch, and saw indeed uh, that, that we had pretty confirming information that these were brand name tablets which had been overcoated with a green color. Now, as the subcommittee understands it, the FDA heard about, uh, about the problem, or at least about your suspicions, very soon after you first uh, uh, discovered the color discrepancy? Yes, sir. Uh, Do Dr. Hyden? Yes, what? sir. Uh, I wanted to have an opportunity to speak with Mr. Kaplan, our counsel, uh, especially since this was not a marketed product. I felt I had a couple of days to assess the situation. Mr. Kaplan was on a trip in Europe. He returned that weekend, and on that Sunday, uh, which would have been June 11th, we had a meeting at my house. I showed the samples to him, and on June 12th, uh, Mr. Kaplan contacted the uh, FDA and informed them of uh, the nature of the problem, or that a problem existed. On June 14th, as Mr. Larry Dorio informed you earlier, the FDA investigator, during his testimony, we fully described our findings, gave him samples uh, on June 14th. What is, what is bioequivalence testing and why is bioequivalence testing needed, Doctor? Briefly. Bio, a demonstration of bioequivalence, uh, with few exceptions, is, is required as a condition of approval. It is required that the product, the generic version of the product you intend to market, be able to be demonstrated that it is equivalent to the brand name product with respect to extent and rate of absorption. Does the substitution mean then, if we could simplify this and, and try to put this in understandable terms, that Vitarine's product was never fully tested for bioequivalence as required by law? On that particular product, we never received an approval. It's a non-marketed product. The one we found was the third in a series of three studies. Dr. Colton has never confirmed for me whether the first two studies were performed in a similar manner. Why did the uh, substitution fraud uh, occur? I can't answer that, sir. Or why would it occur? I can't answer that either, sir. I, I can't see, I cannot it, conceive of a, of a logical reason for this substitution to have been undertaken. Is it possibly that all five or most of the five products were difficult to copy so as to meet bioequivalency standards? I believe that at least two of the five would have been relatively simple to copy based on prior experience we had. On the other three, I, I can't draw an assessment. If this substitution, uh, Dr. Hyden, happened in other products or in other companies, couldn't the health and safety of the American public be directly threatened? That's a very difficult question for me to answer. Uh, I, I just couldn't draw, draw a conclusion that w without knowing what additional information or evidence and what type of product it would be. So, substitution occurred on one product sent to Pharma Kinetics and two products that were sent to Bio Decisions. Is that what happened? Uh, substitution, the first, the first discovered substitution was from a bioequivalent study performed by Bio Decision Laboratories. The Three of the others were performed at Pharmakinetics Laboratory, and the last one we discovered was also performed at Biodecision Laboratories. Aren't there any cross-checks or tests on the product that actually goes out the door for the bioequivalence testing? The product, 
that is manufactured in the ANDA batch is subject to extensive testing, uh, full testing, accelerated stability testing. At the time that the batch or the samples are to go out to bioequivalence testing, a portion of that batch is, is what is sent out. To the best of my belief, it's only that small portion that represented the disguised portion. And, and we assumed, I assumed, if Dr. Colton gave me a sample, or if Dr. Colton himself sent a sample to the bioequivalence laboratory, that it represented a true sample from that batch. Who in the company knew about the switch on diazide? No one, except until the 23rd of June when we sent our vice president of quality assurance down to Pharmacinetics to look at the samples. That was our first indication that there had been a substitution. Do you wish to add to that, Dr. Hyden? No, sir. Okay. Who in the company knew about the other switches? No one in the company knew, uh, to, the best of, to the best of my knowledge, uh, no one in the company knew about the other switches other than Dr. Colton who acknowledged them. Dr. Hyden, why didn't you know what was going on? Well, I, I knew very well what was going on in the research and development uh, area. Uh, I had, I had uh, full knowledge of, of those activities, but I don't believe that, that if there was any system or procedure in use uh, that was common practice at that time that would have permitted me to be aware of the, of the subtle and devious kind of substitution that took place. The, the, uh, uh, I didn't know about it because it was not anyone's intention to, to bring it to me. So do you think all the companies are vulnerable to this kind of uh, substitution fraud? I wouldn't want to make that kind of broad as a generalization. But uh, I think it is conceivable that uh, that could, that could occur on, on, on uh, other occasions. I, I just would like to know more about why this, uh, this wasn't detected, you know, why this wasn't un uncovered. Um, you've said it's very uh, devious uh, kind of ac activity, but uh, if it is, we still ought to know what, what's, uh, what's going on. Are we just forced to sit well, back and hope that it doesn't happen? No. In this particular case, especially as, Dr. as Mr. Jordan indicated, uh, Dr. Colton had a relationship with us that went back about a half a dozen years, a trusted relationship. He had reported to me in the same position, uh, same responsibilities he'd held for me for five years at Cord Laboratories. He and Cord Laboratories and, and all of us had had an excellent track record. He was a trusted and, and uh, I thought very reliable and loyal subordinate. And I saw no reason to, to provide any, any more checks over the ones that were normally in place. Well, I, I'm going to uh, gonna move on, but I'm, I'm certainly concerned that under what you have described uh, took place, other companies would be uh, subjected to or vulnerable to substitution fraud and uh, this may be a subject we wish to recur return to soon. Now, doctor, the FDA has told us that on ANDAs for more than one dozen products, Vitarine falsely overstated the amount of product manufactured in pilot batch sizes. Can you describe for the subcommittee what led to the discovery of this problem? During the course of an inspection at St. Croix, where we had filed an ANDA to manufacture generic diazide in St. Croix as, an, as a second facility, uh, the FDA inspector was uh, given a batch record during the inspection that was purported to be the batch record on file in the ANDA. Upon examination, the inspector found that that batch record that he was handed did not match the batch record that was in the ANDA. Uh, subsequently, upon my learning of, these, of this act occurrence, I went to St. Croix, was able to confirm that we indeed had two batch records. Uh, one, 
the one on file in the ANDA, and the second one, which was the actual batch record, which represented a batch that had not been manufactured to completion. On learning of these events, I instructed Dr. Colton to perform a similar or undertake, initiate a similar investigation of all of our products, all of our ANDA filings for Springfield Gardens, and that led to the subsequent events. Why were the sizes of these pilot batches consistently overstated to the agency? I, I don't know, uh, Mr. Wyden. Uh, I, I cannot conceive of a logical reason why they should have been. Is there any benefit to the company or, or to particular employees? We're, we're talking about essentially all of these events occurring during an era when the FDA stated requirement was that a, a batch for an ANDA be of a size of 10 kilograms or greater. Uh, not a, a very large batch and not a batch that would take an excessive amount of time to complete. I, I can't s perceive of any real benefit. Why did this go undetected for so long? Because the Dr. Colton and his subordinate both were willing to sign to the batch records, one as having been the one who manufactured and the second as having been the one who reviewed or witnessed the operation and they were able to provide for the ANDA filings and for the review by the other people in the, in the chain uh, batch records which on their appearance uh, met all of the requirements. Who, uh, who knew about the falsification? No one other than I believe Dr. Colton and his subordinate Dr. Nawako. And why didn't you know what was going on? Because the, the records that were submitted for submission into the ANDA were of a nature that, that appeared to be totally within good manufacturing practices and of a proper batch size. Dr. FDA testimony and documents reveal a massive breakdown of accurate record keeping within the company. Documents were missing and destroyed, altered, uh, recreated. My question is, aren't these kinds of records critical to quality control and to confidence that a bioequivalent product was being properly tested and manufactured? I would not wish to take issue with the investigator, but uh, I believe he was referring only to those records that were under the control of Dr. Colton. All of the records relating to the testing, the stability, the analytical uh, data, all are or original, authentic, and were available. We do know from, from uh, uh, reports to us by the technician who worked for Dr. Colton that at least a large number of samples and uh, inventory cards were destroyed, purported to be destroyed during the last few days of Dr. Colton's tenure. So it's hard to say now what may or may not have happened to original batch records. We just don't have them. Was there a systematic cover-up of illegal uh, actions, first by altering and recreating documents and later by just destroying the records? I'm sorry, I, I don't... Was there a systematic cover-up of illegal actions by altering and destroying these uh, documents? The only part of your sentence I guess I would take issue with is, is, is cover-up. Uh, well, was it, it, was it systematic? It appeared as, appeared as though, and, and our own investigation, which Mr. Dorio also indicated, was conducted concurrently with the FDA's investigation, and in many instances, or most instances, preceded their findings. It certainly appeared as though frequently a batch of a smaller size was manufactured and then a batch of a larger size was what was submitted to be filed in the ANDA. Mr. Jordan, did you want to add uh, to Dr. Hyden's response on that? Well, I, you, you said it's systematic, and I had re referenced in, in my, uh, in my uh, report to the committee that there was a continuing pattern that Steve and Dr. Nowako had apparently followed over a period of 18, 18 months or so, 
And from that standpoint, I would have to agree with your characterization in that you, regard. You would agree with my characterization? As far as there being a pattern, yes. Uh, where you, uh, we had plenty of product to do the stability studies and the, and the bioavailability studies, but there was an o overstatement, apparently, of how many actually were tableted or encapsulated. Mr. Jordan, what is Vitarine doing in response to the FDA letter to you of August 22nd regarding withdrawals of 25 of the ANDAs? Well, we have, uh, what are we doing? Uh, there are, we have written a letter to, to Mr. Michaels uh, outlining our position relative to uh, uh, that position. I touched on it briefly in my report. Uh, we feel it's, I guess we would feel it's uh, overkill for one thing. Uh, we've withdrawn these products four months ago from... You're, uh, you're opposing revocation, the, are you not? Uh, yes, sir. I'm opposed to revocation, not necessarily for myself, but for the 140 employees that I'd like to keep working at Vitarine. On, on what grounds uh, is revocation being opposed? It's being opposed on the, on the grounds that we have cured. I've spent over $2 million on bio studies on, on 12 or 14 products. We have gone out, we stopped selling product, we went out, redid the, every, every bit of work that had to be done, if it was, if it was a, a bio study or if it was a product transfer, we have, we have redone all of that work at substantial expense to reconfirm that these products are, that there was no uh, efficacy or safety issues involved we feel that that activity has cured any deficiency that any misstatement that there might have been in the NDA filing. For example, if, if we did have a short batch, uh, which, was which the bio batch was based on, we now have run a bioavailability studies on batches as large as, uh, as large as 4 million capsules or 4 million tablets to reconfirm the data that we had originally. Mr. White? Ms. Uh, let me uh, counsel. Uh, can advise his clients, but counsel is not here as a witness. Does counsel wish to advise his clients? Well, it was just a, a legal point on, on the opposing revocation that I just wanted to clarify for the record. But it's... Let, let us have you clarify it for the, for the record. Well, well, there is no revocation of if, policy. If, if, if you choose to advise your client who can make a clarification for the record, but let me advise counsel he is here to advise his clients, not as a witness. I, I regret any impropriety, but it, it was just a, a statement that may be taken different than if, its If context. counsel wishes to advise his client... Right. Let me also state, counsel, that the record will be held open for a letter from counsel on this point Thank as you. well. C Council wishes me to remind the chair and the, and the subcommittee that no notice of revocation has been published. All that Vitarine has been informed is that the FDA intends to publish. In the meantime, uh, over the past several months, we have been repairing through the submission of new data all of the deficiencies in the ANDAs. The witnesses' additional views on this subject are helpful and uh, appreciated. Mr. Jordan, is Vitarine arguing, in effect, that it should derive some benefit from the fraudulent application? In effect, if it's not required to start over, isn't that what really is taking place, that Vitarine would derive some benefit from the fraudulent application? Well, we've... I, I would say we have suffered substantially, probably in excess of $100 million. Uh, we paid a pretty st stiff penalty. Uh, we have uh, uh, to start over. I, I don't know where, they're, where the advantage of starting over from scratch. We have redone the bioavailability studies, which is the crux of the, uh, of the approval process. We've gone to that expense and so on. Uh, as far as the company being uh, being put put out of business by the act of, of two people, uh, a lot of other innocent people are being are uh, would will suffer if we're uh, 
if we're not able to eventually get back into the marketplace. And I'm not speaking for myself in any way. Mr. White, if I may also add to that. Legally, uh, we, we do have approved ANDAs. There are misstatements of facts in many of these ANDAs. In some cases, there are not even misstatements of facts. There is simply an inability to find the supporting records. So some of the, some of the ANDAs don't have misstatements. What we're doing simply is, is, is exercising what we believe is, is the correct, and we've so stated, I think, in our, in our submissions, the correct legal interpretation, which is to moot the deficiencies in the ANDAs by correcting and submitting proper data. Uh, even the original ANDAs, uh, unlike some of the comments that were, were presented today, we, d we don't have cases where we did a bioequivalent study on Formula A and have been manufacturing Formula B. The products of which we manufactured, which we had tested in bioequivalent studies, albeit of small batches, are indeed the same formulae that have been used for all of the commercial production batches and remain unchanged to date. Uh, and, excuse me, sir, and they duplicate all FDA-approved specifications and the behavior of the bio-batches. Would revoking the affected ANDAs provide a much clearer and stronger impetus to generic uh, drug companies to clean up uh, these problems? Mr. Jordan? Well, I, I believe that there are... Well, it's very hard to answer. I, it certainly, it certainly would get one's attention, to say the least, sir. Uh, but I believe that there perhaps are, are many other uh, administrative uh, methods that the agency will have, especially coming out of these hearings and so on, uh, to correct uh, uh, essentially uh, mistakes that uh, are not part of a, co a company-wide practice. Dr. Hyden, do you have anything that you would uh, like to add uh, in addition? All right. No, thank you. Gentlemen, you all have uh, been, uh, been very patient. We appreciate your attendance at, uh, at the uh, subcommittee. The subcommittee also is uh, appreciative of your cooperation and know that you have uh, cooperated uh, with the staff in, uh, in this inquiry. And uh, unless you gentlemen have anything further, the subcommittee stands adjourned.